Um, we have celebrated and used trees that have come from farms. Um, all the timber, we haven't used any FSC, for, that's Forest Stewardship Council timber on any, any part of the building. Uh, in late July <clears throat> last year, we actually harvested a tree in, uh, in Ballarat. It was uh, a macrocarpa that was from the 1870s, 1880s. We're not quite sure when it was planted. And yeah, it's, uh, we, we milled it on site with a Lucas mill. It went into a, a kiln that was actually a powered, solar powered kiln and turned it into a kitchen, dining room table, staircase, uh, wall cladding. Um, and yeah, we used sugar gum, again, uh, a source from a farm to make the chairs, the dining room chairs. So if you've had dinner at the Future Food System, you sat on one of those chairs, all made in Ballarat. At, um, Aaron Moore Furniture and Andrew who owns Aaron Moore Furniture is somebody that is really keen to steer the business towards offering every single piece of furniture that he sells. Um, he wants to be able to offer agroforestry timber for all those. So when you order that table, everything is custom made, everything is made to order. And he's really keen to start getting farmers in and around Ballarat and uh, to start growing, planting trees for, you know, the next generation of furniture makers. So, we're big believers in that. Um, I first became aware of uh, the problems with single species monoculture forestry when I was in South America, where they were clearing. I was in, uh, on the Ecuadorian side, on the Peruvian side, actually, of um, um, the Amazon. And we were, I'm, I'm obsessed with plants, as most people know. And uh, I'm a florist and love botany. So we had a botanist as a, as a guide, and we went deep into the Amazon for a couple of weeks and when we introduced ourselves um he said where are you from and i said uh, i'm from australia and he said i like australians but i don't like australian plants and i said well what do you mean by that and he said um australian eucalypts will ultimately destroy the, the amazon rainforest and he explained that they were clearing vast i mean it's it's not you can't comprehend how much land is being cleared until you actually go there and you see it from the plane but um what they do is they graze it or they try and crop it and then they graze it. And ultimately the, the soil is so poor that the only thing that will grow is eucalypts. And this was 20 years ago, mind you. And he said, what happens is during the wet season, thunderstorms come through, lightning hits the Amazon. It's no problem because the soil, the, you know, it's the humidity is so high, the, the trees are so full of fo uh, moisture that, you know, it does nothing. Those same storms are now hitting these plantation eucalypt forests and, and they were causing um, firestorms for the first time. That was 20 years ago. Anyway, when I saw those, those uh, bushfires go through the Amazon a couple of years ago, I just kept thinking about what he told me. And, you know, my philosophy is that biodiversity is uh, the key. And um, I just, yeah, monoculture just doesn't, doesn't do anything for me. And uh, there's a documentary being made about the future food system. And we went with the camera crew into a, uh, a forest, actually a redwood forest that's near Warburton that was planted in the 1930s as a, a project to see what trees would do well in that, in that uh, situation. There's lots and lots of pockets of different trees that were planted there. And the sound guy said, this is insane. We're standing in the middle of a forest and there's no sound. You basically, there is no noise. There's no birds. There's no wildlife. There is nothing. And of course, that is a system that's often celebrated by, um, and that's, a system that works and is the most profitable because you're getting rid of any competition. So the trees are all uniform. They all grow fast. They all grow at the same speed and they're all the same size, but that's not how nature works. And um, I think it's a disaster because it's something that um, I think the world has understood to be sustainable and green. And I think the greenwashing, there's a, a movement called uh, FSC watch in Sweden. Um, and I'm a keen follower of their work and uh, now Greta Thunberg is on board and realizes the damage that's even being done in Sweden where they're, you know, um, saying, well, we're killing biodiversity and, and calling it green. And so this is happening all over the world, Russia, Canada, Australia, um, South America, obviously. Um, but I also got to meet somebody that represented uh, private forest owners about 25 years ago who came out once a year and we always had dinner and, um, that's when I realized that Australia, America has, has actually a really good system of private ownership where they do practice agroforestry. So they combine different um, 
you know, they may have beef or they may have other crops, but they also have trees and they, that's where a lot of the sustainable oak comes from. And, and that's when I started to realize, you know, our farmers could really be um, our future timber suppliers and, and create wildlife corridors. And, and uh, I got to meet the Stewart family and, um, and uh, the Stewart family told me about Rowan and um, I went on their farm and was just blown away how they transformed what uh, the photos that they showed me from a, from the farm that existed 30 years earlier to what it is today. It's um, incredible. Yan Yan Gert Farm in Dean's Marsh. And with the help of Rowan have completely transformed their, their farm and are now harvesting timber. And I think it's a really inc incredible example of what can be done. And, uh, and Christy got to meet Neil Perry, who ended up talking to Alan Joyce and, and Christy also got to meet the CEO of Country Road. And these big Australian companies are all really keen to get behind helping small Australian farmers through their carbon credits that they're already collecting through their sales to start rewilding and creating uh, agroforestry pockets and, and start helping farmers to actually plant trees. Somebody that's done this for a lot longer um, is Rowan. He's an expert on it and has many books and I actually realized that when Christy told me about Rowan that I actually owned one of his books that was written in 1985. Um, so yeah, Rowan, uh, so good to have you on. And uh, yeah, you're a real, like the Heartwood, the book that you've just released, or it's really, what is it, two years ago now, a year and a half ago. I recommend it to everyone when we do our tours. And it's probably out of all the topics in our house, the agroforestry story is the one that people are most fascinated by and most interested in. And and um, I'm so glad we can finally have you here on this live stream. So do you want to just give us um, a bit of history, how you started? Yeah, well, I, I will. Thank you very much. And that's a, a great introduction because it highlights uh, one of the issues. Um, I'm actually a forest scientist uh, by background or, or a forester. Um, the distinctions uh, I like actually, because uh, forester sounds like you're actually the one with the chainsaw or doing the tree planting and the scientist, and I do both, uh, a little bit like Andrew Stewart, he's an ag scientist and a farmer. And I think that's why we get on so well and work so closely together, because we're impassionate about our profession, but also changing that profession in some way and working through it. And uh, so the, um, the activities, you know, you've highlighted uh, these issues about forestry has become a, a a problem it's become like coal mining it's become like all these negative things and we're we're really for most of the community they don't see forestry as part of the future but you've just identified that there is a real role for forestry in the future it's just going to have to be done differently and the way we've been treating native forest uh dividing the native forest up into an area for production and an area for conservation and having these forestry walls of walls over where the line is, is to my mind, the reason why I never worked for government in native forestry. Yeah. And then the plantation highlighted the, uh, the issue of large scale monoculture plantations. It's, it's, it's not the species fault in a way, you know, you've got Pinus radiata and blue gum plantation in Australia, you've got eucalypts over, overseas. Uh, it's it's the scale of the management and and the way that the trees, as you pointed out, a very dense crop of trees growing very quickly. They're very high water users. So whether it's in India or or parts of Africa, where you've got uh, very high stocking rate, short rotation eucalypts sapping up a lot of water, uh, rather than trees actually bringing the water table to the surface and rewatering the uh, the wells like I saw in Indonesia. It's actually the opposite. The water tables are dropping because the water is all going through transpiration at this scale. So I'm really concerned that a lot of people are rejecting forestry uh, because of these negative, you know, very clear issues that they're not comfortable with them and stuff like that. But I'd, I'd like to turn it around and say forestry is just, it's a bit like the botanic gardens or gardening. It can be beautiful. It's yeah. just, it's the same science. It's the same technologies and the same aspects. So when we look at farming, we can create these beautiful farms. And you highlighted it by saying, uh, you know, 
wildlife corridors and uh, and patches of production and some areas of mixed tree species and some areas where stock are grazing under trees this is not my property but it's one of the most beautiful farms that i've been to in western australia it's actually owned by by a couple of a, a very passionate tree growing couple and jenny over there is I just, it just tells a story about all the things that she's using trees on her farm to do. And that's, that's what I'm passionate about, working with farmers to find those, uh, those solutions, those ways that trees can answer their problems, but also address your problems or your needs and the rest of the market about where we can get sustainable wood in the future. And uh, it's the same around the world. I've, uh, I've worked in many countries, uh, not so much the last two years, I've been locked in at the farm. But uh, you know, in East Timor, for example, uh, this this project uh, involving an Australian NGO working with farmers there, we ran a farmer education course, one of our master tree growers with them. Uh, that's me talking about how trees grow and aspects like that. Now, you know, well, you can see all one species here, but the blots are very small. So yep. that it's when we talk, talk about monocultures, it's really about scale about looking at from a bird's eye view, what does a, what does a bird flying over the landscape see? And in this landscape, it's the diversity of the patches, it's the tapestry in that landscape that becomes really important. And so when we're working with farmers, we're trying to work out how, what sort of tapestry or landscape could actually generate their interest in some way. So that's, that's really what I'm passionate about. Uh, it's also, yeah, it's also re really interesting how, um... Uh, you know, the, the, the way that like uh, what well, they've done at Yan Yan Gert Farm, you know, that idea that they identified all the areas that were suffering erosion and were causing problems. And, and um, I'm not sure, I think it's in the end, only 25 or 30% of their farm that they actually ended up locking up to trees. But, you know, I, I'm not sure how many thousands of trees, but there's a lot that have been planted. And there's so many examples when you drive around the Australian countryside where you see erosion and problem, you know, where water collects or where um, salina, uh, salt is becoming a rising salt levels. And, and so we have over 130,000 farmers in Australia that even if they planted just 10 trees a year, you know, can you imagine in as little as 20 years, we're talking about being able to access hundreds of millions of trees, especially if they get paid for it through carbon credits and, you know, you can really transform the landscape. The, the gains are like in terms of percentage of the farming landscape, in most areas we're down to less than 5% remnant vegetation or a few planted trees here and there. And uh, what we know from work I've done with Andrew and farmers around and, and researchers, depending on the landscape, how windy it is and how steep the landscape is and how many drainage lines there are, you're really looking at 15 to 20% of the farm is available for tree planting without having any impact on animal production. Yep. And so when you, when you sort of use, use a common term locking up land, it's not locking it up if it's actually enhancing the whole property. It's, yep. it's, it's like people perceive they're giving up, but you're not giving up because you're getting out of those shelter and water and, and other benefits and the timber, that we so desperately need as a renewable resource that's carbon neutral or whatever and locks up carbon can actually come from that landscape. So we in Australia, where 60% of the farming, the land, whole landscape is actually managed by farmers. Imagine 15 or 20% of that in tree planting and a high proportion of that growing both Australian natives and even some exotic species for high quality timber. We could be, you know, we could be a timber exporter again. Yeah. in terms of quality rather than just wood chips. And then there's also the opportunity to create, um, you know, uh, fly ret uh, fire retardant belts, you know, using oaks and other species that have um, performed so well, especially during the King Lake bushfires where there, there were a lot of exotic trees that actually saved many homes. And, um, you know, there's an opportunity there to, to use deciduous trees. So you've got shade in summer and um, for, you know, protection sun protection in, in summer for the animals and, shade, and, and lots of um, light coming through in winter. Um, yeah. Like for me, this is such a simple, logical, practical solution to, um, you know, changing our landscape and it can happen so fast. Like, you know, 20 years is nothing. 
Yeah, I'll, I'll show you some photos of before and after. And in that sense, uh, you know, everyone's familiar with regenerative agriculture, which is really what we're talking about now. Yeah. And, uh, and Charles Massey's book's been fantastic in developing that. And the notion that the tree growing and even the act of cutting a tree down, producing a product from it, or even harvesting seeds and other things can be part of that story is fantastic. So I'll just show you what our farm looked like. That's what it looked like in 1987. Um, we purchased a farm with the express purpose of trying to do what many people see as the impossible, make yep. forestry attractive to farmers. And because uh, like you said, there's been all these years clear in the country and, uh, and some, some young guy comes around and said, maybe we should be putting a few trees back and even those trees, we should be cutting them down. But the point really about if I was to make forestry, my profession attractive, we had to change forestry. It wasn't the farmers that had to change. And uh, I'm very critical of my profession and government agencies who have tried to change farmers into foresters to get lots of trees in the ground. So now we've got to change forestry. So we have to make it not only look different, but behave different, differently in that. So this, um, this little shot, this is where we are now. We're, that same creek, we're now harvesting trees selectively out of that. And uh, I was quite proud to get that footage on Gardening Australia because I think it's the it's yeah. same show you were on. And, yeah. um, and that, uh, that notion that, what's this guy doing cutting trees down on Gardening Australia? Aren't we supposed to be just planting? But this is, this is part of the story. It actually, it's part of the evolution. And what we're doing is now harvesting the eucalypts, which are obviously fast growing. And behind it, what I leave behind is a rainforest. I've got a whole series of uh, high quality timbers because uh, I'm actually concerned about having too many eucalypts in the landscape for the same reason that uh, people in South America are for the bushfire threat. Yeah, so I'm yeah. trying to create a lower, lower fuel or lower eucalypt component. In We'll still have some eucalypts, but they'll be the, the old growth overstory of a rainforest dominated landscape, but that rainforest will also be producing timber. So in that fashion, so create changing that landscape and creating these, wow. these new pitch. That's only after 14 years of tree growing and wow. building a steering shed and building the house. Uh, the Creek is in front of you. You can't see it anymore. Uh, but the difference there from land care, and the difference from monoculture forestry, and there's a bit of monoculture forestry up, up there on the hills behind and on different properties uh, from us of the top left. It's neither really. It's what we're finding now is we're actually, even though we're actively managing with the, and even harvesting trees, we're getting more biodiversity and better environmental outcomes in terms of uh, erosion control than conventional land care. Wow. And that's, that's where we both need to act in terms of that, bringing those complicated areas together of the jigsaw puzzle and saying, how can I plant a forest that's not only beautiful, it's good for biodiversity, it looks after agriculture, but also produces a product. Where in the past, most people see these as contradictory. Production and conservation can't happen in the same paddock, let alone the same forest. We're really challenging that. And yeah. I think that's where my background as a, as a, as a forest scientist who learnt, uh, I grew up in a native forest environment. I, I studied the native forest and how important disturbance is in a native forest for biodiversity. How our, our, our native systems here, highly dependent, not on a mega fire, they want a, a little fire or they want yeah. a, a few lightning strikes or occasional storms. And, and what we've done is create these landscapes which are more susceptible to, you know, catastrophic events rather than having these small disturbances. And with uh, Indigenous burning, for example, we're starting to acknowledge that there is a role for humans to intervene, intervene in nature and adapt it and direct it in a slightly different way. And it can make it actually better for biodiversity and many of those outcomes in some way. So the timber that we're producing now, and this is a, a table I made, I'm no artisan table maker, but uh, it sits right out there under the pergola out here in the house. Uh, but I grew that table. And yep. uh, it's really quite satisfying to be able to, uh, to, to, well, now we're building a house out of our own timber, but not only to sell some to furniture makers, but also say, well, you know, I can, 
I can give my my children and my grandchildren furniture that we actually planted and grew on the farm. But those same trees have been delivering these environmental benefits all the, all along. So it's 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 really different. That's that's my paddock uh, on the left. Uh, it's got a mixture of native and, and exotics, and uh, I'm really passionate about uh, the management. You wouldn't get that if you just went and bought some land, planted trees and walked away. You wouldn't create the, the, the values. And I'd argue you wouldn't create the aesthetics if you just said, oh, we've got to plant trees and lock up the land. It's actually the addition of a human being who can anticipate and direct the growth of the trees in order to create, as I said, the beautiful landscape that's also productive, that's, all, that's my fire break, actually, that, that paddock. It's a, it's a grazed uh, poplar and black walnut paddock to the, the north. It's quite linear. And it's, a, it's actually a, a great fire break to our southern part of the farm where the house is because the fire yeah. would have to go through that. And it's, uh, it's, as you said, exotic trees with green leaves grazed underneath. Uh, it's cool and it keeps the pasture a little bit green in summer. So it's good. It, it's quite the difference. And that's me on the left climbing trees. It's that active management that's really important. And uh, so we don't, we don't get these landscapes just by paying farmers to stop managing their land and plant native trees and put them back. We don't get the products unless we actually also involve the farmers and partners and provide the education and support and knowledge so they can be active in that in that in some way. And that's why I travel the world. And uh, this, is, this is the analogy that I, this is actually in East Timor. You know, you've, we've all seen this if you've traveled overseas, the, the kids running a tire down the hill yep. and hitting it with a stick. And uh, I often say that, you know, I, I hear people say, I'm just going to plant some trees and let nature take its course. And I say, well, that's like that kid standing on top of the hill, throwing that tire down and laughing and thinking one day it goes this way, one day it goes that way. Just because he's letting the tire run down the hill, it doesn't mean that it's going to go to the same place every time. It doesn't mean if you plant a forest and don't touch it, it will be best for biodiversity or best for timber production or more biodiverse or something like that. So it's actually the game, if you like, is to have someone constantly there working the forest, the same way we work our paddocks, look after our fences, work our stock, to, to uh, tweak growth as it occurs. Hit it a little bit with a stick and direct that growth to where you want to take it. And what we've seen in big forestry, because they can't afford to do that because they, the, you know, they've got a small crew and they work from cities and stuff like that. Uh, they just plant the trees, come back 20 years later, you know, cut half the trees down and come back another 20 years later and cut them all down. But what I've seen in family forestry, and you alluded to this, right around the world, these people live on their farms. They can go out, as I do, I visit every tree every year, and some, some foresters tell me I'm gardening, but I'm able to manipulate and work out which trees I, I want to prune, which ones I want to thin, how I want to direct that growth, which ones I can now harvest, and what will happen when I create that disturbance and release that space. And... Um, and I'm passionate about it because it's so exciting to see a forester. Uh, the other analogy, it's like being a, uh, a conductor of an orchestra. I've got 50 species out there in all different configurations with agriculture and, and concerned about fire and biodiversity. And I'm like the conductor. I don't know it all, but I'm watching and learning and then tweaking a little bit here and there to direct the growth as it goes. And that's, that's why I work with farmers rather than trees, yeah, because yeah. it's the farmers who will actually do the tree growing. And uh, we see a lot of tree planting projects around the world. You know, even Boris Johnson's out there saying we're going to plant a billion trees. And our government says they're going to plant a billion trees. But we need a billion farmers who are tree growers. We don't need a billion trees. Well, we you know, what, I, what I've seen is there's this massive disconnect between, you know, we've got corporations that are collecting carbon credits whether it's you know Qantas obviously not at the moment but energy companies oil companies um you know the, the we're already all, all paying this um uh, mm. you know 
And the money's there, but everyone's going, where's this money going? And then you've got 130,000 privately owned farms that we could pay, not, and I'm, you know, I don't believe they should be paid once for planting the trees. They should be planted, they should be paid annually for maintaining yeah. that tree. And then, you know, there shouldn't be a consequence. There should be a benefit at the end of 25 years for harvesting some of those trees. Now, you know, a lot of people would say, well, that's crazy. You know, we shouldn't, well, maybe one in 20 trees stays for two or 300 years. You know, we, we plant some trees for, to live a very long life. And, and yeah, I don't know. There's, I really think that the general public would get on board. No problem. If there's support for this. It's just, and so um, at a, at a co uh, corporate cultural level, there's support for this. So we just need to work out, you know, how to go about it, how to make it happen. I think that's right. Like, I've, been on, I've been on the Qantas jet and I've looked at where they're spending their money and they're just basically planting trees on farms and walking away. Yeah. And I, like I say, if we direct that money to the actual growers, you know, the people who drive the tractors and harvest the tree and prune the tree and, and stuff like that, we get this active management, I, I keep coming back to it. And uh, so it's that, and I think the public is actually really sympathetic with the idea of, um, of, of, of keeping farmers in the landscape, keeping farmers viable. Yep. And rather than just invest this environmental money, which is what it is, in tree planting and basically do what they do in Europe, they pay farmers not to farm. <laughs> yep. They get them to stop farming and they get them just to plant trees and don't do anything to them. We yep. can be much, much smarter at that and actually be involved in that. And um, so, uh, yeah, this is a, this is a, what is it, a 30-year-old tree I harvested, milled it up on our own uh, little, little sawmill. Now, I'd love it if we had some really good sawmills, you know, $5 million sawmills around our who could do some high quality production, but they all got closed down because they locked up the native forest. We're really good at stopping forestry, but not investing in new, new type of infrastructure that we need. Um, so we've got a solar kiln. I can dry the timber in that. Uh, it's slow, but uh, you've got to get it down for furniture 10 or 12%. And uh, that tree that I, I harvested, uh, just two, three meter logs for it, uh, you know, you introduced me to Mark Tucky uh, Furniture when they were producing furniture in Melbourne. Yep. And uh, from from one tree, but I think he produced about uh, uh, two beds and three tables and stuff like that. Yep. And uh, and I like to think, well, as a tree stood in the paddock, maybe it's worth two hundred. I milled it and dried the timber and turned that into two thousand, and he turned it into I don't know twenty grand worth yep. of furniture. And this could be what's happening all around because there's plenty of people who can make great furniture and they don't yep. need expensive, expensive, like you said, Ballarat. Uh, yep. We could have these artisan craftsmen producing high quality timber. Um, I can't by myself produce the scale. All I can do is show its potential. But with Andrew, we've got uh, in the Otways alone, we've got 200 members of our Otway Agroforestry Network. Uh, a lot of the reason I do the sort of experimental side and introduction of the market because their trees are about 10 years behind mine and I need to get yeah, the right. market to, to start experiencing this timber. And you just showing people farm-grown timber gives yep. them the confidence to ask for farm-grown timber because most people would say, oh, 20-year-old tree, that's no good. You know, it's not going to be dense enough and stuff. And the, but that's not true. This wood actually is as dense as old growth timber uh, from yeah. about 30 years old. Big, I'm a big believer. I don't uh, believe in so much in government getting involved in forcing policy or forcing change because then it always ends up going pear-shaped or gets over, yeah. you know, it just, there, there's hundreds of years of examples of that going wrong. So I believe in creating demand by the consumers. So if the consumers ring up Aaron Moore Furniture and say, I want that bed, I love it. Can I get it sourced from a local um, farm? Sure. You know, so it's about making the, the general public aware that this is possible. You can go into Mark Tucky and get a locally grown table. Um, and I think that, that uh, consumers are so um, surprised by this possibility. But, you know, yeah. to me, it's like if a country like Australia can't do this, we're all in trouble, right? Yeah, yeah well, that's right. And the... Uh... And, and, and I can, you know, that's why I grow so many different species because I need to 
need to prove that oh, I need to find out myself and then tell other people that this timber can be really valuable. And, and this carbon story, that block of wood, that 10 centimetre square block of eucalypt timber that I planted and grew and milled up, it contains the carbon dioxide in that beach board. Wow. And every little block of wood contains that much volume of carbon dioxide. And all the mathematics is there at the side. You don't have to worry about that. But if we can just see every time you buy or, or, or use wood that came from a planted tree on a cleared farm, what once one was a cleared farm, yep. and, and the farmer is growing a tree in its place, this is, uh, this is forever locking up. And we have a carbon market now that doesn't acknowledge that there is value in the, in the carbon locked in wood. The, the carbon accounting scheme that we've adopted in Australia only counts the carbon in this forest as it stands. And if you plant trees, you can grow a lot of carbon, but it reaches a maximum and it can't go any higher. Trees will start dying, they kill each other for space and, and, um, and stuff like that. And then you start getting decay. But if you, if you continually take out some of that, those trees and turn them into a product that has a long life, such as wood in a house or wood in furniture and, and stuff like that, you can actually grow that carbon back on that site. And I like to think of our forests as a carbon factory. They're actually producing carbon as a product. And that yeah. carbon is just, just wood. Half that block of wood is carbon. You know, the, we know it. You know, we've known it for, for so long since science actually looked at wood. We've known it's actually made of carbon. And every piece, every carbon molecule in there had to come from carbon dioxide. Yep. It can't come from the soil. It has to come from carbon dioxide. So it's so simple. We know, we know what's doing. But then we have these bureaucrats and these auditors coming in there, making all these rules. And then these green groups come in there and say, oh, we don't want to encourage people to chop trees down. So we're not going to allow them to account for the carbon in wood. And I said, well, it's, it's true though, isn't it? Isn't yeah. it true? We're locking it up. So we, we, we got to take it actually out of the hands of, of, of the big lobbyists from either side and the government and get an arrangement where the buyer just wants to know that they're locking up carbon and they're yep. getting their wood from a place who, who's replanting. And, uh, and that'll be enough for us to generate that market pool that you've described where furniture makers and builders are coming to us like you have and said, I want timber from you guys, not from the other guys. Yeah. And uh, that's, that's exciting. The only problem is it takes time. So yep. we, need, we need people to be patient and say, well, don't, don't, it's like these emails you get from China. So we, do you produce eucalypt timber? Yep. Oh, we'll have a thousand containers. Yes. <laughs> no, we can't do that. We can't do that. So it's, uh, it's, it's going to be slow build, but there's enough people like yourself who are, who are keen to lead the way. And we've got enough timber for those people now to start doing it. And it can only build up, which is exciting. And um, so it's that carbon factory, not a carbon sink. Um, all those eucalypts are now coming out. Uh, I've taken some of them already. And as you can see, the rainforest of blackwood and red cedar and other things developing underneath. We'll have a, a beautiful rainforest along our creek, but I'll have to admit, I'll be harvesting some of those rainforest timbers as well and, uh, and watching the wildlife come back through the process. Yeah. I've got, I'll, I'll show you some of the wildlife. Uh, I, I saw that this, this photo I only got the other day. It's actually, I haven't been there, Nutterwadding uh, basketball court. That's wow. our timber on the roof. Wow. That's, that's, that's veneer from our trees. And it was only 10 trees who were harvested. And uh, it, it's, that's the veneer in the factory. 0.6 of a millimetre thick. It's just the cover of the timber. And uh, it went into the tax office in Dandenong. It went into some furniture. But then I saw this stunning photo. I've got to go in there after the lockdown and have a look. And all that pale timber on the wall and the ceilings is actually come from our creek planting where I planted trees for erosion control and selectively harvested them for timber. So this just proves it's possible. Yep. And I hope by proving it's possible, people say, oh, other farmers start planting and then other people start supporting them, as you say. But what I wanted to show you is that the critters, you know, we've got uh, 
Andy Kynas coming back because we've got wood all over the ground. And the best way to put wood on the ground is actually selectively harvest and leave some what, what foresters call trash and I call wildlife habitat behind yep. after we do it. And, uh, and this one here, this, uh, we plant uh, a number of species here that the sugar gliders actually chew into in winter. The sap comes out. This is the silky oak, but they also do it on the Australian red cedar we grow. Now, some of them, they've actually, they've not destroyed the trees, but it set it back a little bit. But we're actually, our sugar glider population is very high on this farm and sugar gliders need trees. So you can't have them without trees. So we know yep. we've increased the population dramatically. Uh, they do need hollows and we've got some older trees, but they only use hollows for nesting. What they need is feed trees to get through the winter. And so our timber trees are actually feeding biodiversity. and. Uh, from everything from snakes and lizards to, uh, to sugar gliders and antichinus and, and too many wallabies and kangaroos, which are a bit of a nuisance. But uh, we, we've got all that. We, the bird counts are going up all the time. And the stewards' example is fantastic. They've had over 106 different species in their bird count now. And um, the native forest around here only gets 35 species. So... Because I mean, of that tapest tapestry of landscape, water, water bodies and, and different plantings and even exotic trees are able to build up their biodiversity dramatically. I mean, the, the most, uh, yeah, you can see it here. I'm surrounded by, I've got a, a pocket of forest, native forest behind me. And obviously I've got over a thousand species planted here, about 6,000 different plants, yeah. um, but yeah. all for, for harvesting for floristry. But the amount it's of the birds, but they've got that, that forest to go back to. But this is where they get their food. This is where they hang out. Yeah. But then they go back for protection and to sleep in that forest. So it's like, it, you know, it's one of the reasons why we chose this property because we loved it, that, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So if we, if we can turn our farming areas into really a diverse patchwork of different land practices, which includes some land care plantings and some locked up remnant and protected native forest, but that's not enough on its own. To, to really provide biodiversity with the resilience it needs to adapt to climate change and to reduce the threats to the landscape through fire, we need this patchwork of different types of land use that will actually underpin it. And uh, so if you, what I love dr driving around this area and you've been through it, uh, every farm basically has a few trees because we've been going for 30 years and working with the farmers here. And uh, they're all different on every farm. And uh, people say, haven't you guys worked out which species is best yet? And I said, well, no, we're all different. So we all like different things. Yep. And we all think there's different market opportunities. And, you know, if you were here, that you'd have your flowers. The stewards have got their banks here that they're selling. Uh, I sell tree seeds. So I grow some species for that and stuff. And everyone's doing different things. And to me, it's sort of like, we're getting over that hurdle of industrial agriculture where everyone produces the same product yep. and looking at what first world agriculture is going to look like in 50 years time. It's actually everyone producing a range of different products into different markets and farms being viable because they're diversified rather than being commodity producers competing against each other so much. And it's, I mean, that's something that's happening globally. You know, the most successful yeah farms seem to be the ones that are popping up all over the place that have got a whole bunch of different things going on and you know i come from a, a, a family farm where we grew half a dozen different crops and then uh, uh you know in the late 80s you know specialize and do it on mass and um i think what it ended uh, one of my brothers ended up retiring and his son's not working in, a, in the business anymore but i think what it ends up doing is it becomes monotonous work and, yeah. Yeah. you know, you don't have the variation in the seasons. You know, you used to pick irises in, in autumn, uh, in, um, in August or about now. And then the peony roses start and then you've got different things. But then when, once you start growing one thing, you do it on mass. You just, you lose the interest and, and um, you know, it's not good, not good for your brain, not good for your soul. And yeah. I, yeah. I think that that's one of the reasons why so many people are going back to growing seasonally, growing more uh, different things, diversifying. And my dad used to say in Holland a hundred years ago, a dairy farmer or someone that had cows didn't need to own land because everybody wanted those cows on their land. 
and yeah, so, you yeah whereas you know and but that the person that had the cows also had a whole bunch of other stuff you know so yeah um yeah, it's, it's like a, the, the snakes are coming out they're pretty bad I had the snake snake catcher here yesterday getting a big copperhead out of my front garden um so i take the dog for a walk at seven in the morning so he can run free and it's like you say i just walk around with a pair of secateurs and and if you follow my Instagram, it's another photo of something I saw at seven in the morning because I'm just learning so much from the landscape because there's so many different things happening at different seasons. Like you say, so, you know, suddenly, you know, the agathas are bursting out into leaf and uh, at different times and their leaf is a beautiful different colour. That's the Queensland cowrie the, to the copper of the, uh, the mature leaf. And you see all these things at different times. And it keeps you passionate and interested. And then you go and do your day's work, which can be yep. just hard work. But it's, uh, it's seeing that landscape a different way every day that's uh, it's, it's really quite exciting. And then following those seasons in some way. It's good. Is, is, uh, is oh, that so, cockatoo eating, uh, are they pine cones or is that a shio? Well, I was going to, there's, there's two, you know, everyone knows we've got black cockatoos and, and there's, there's essentially... There's the glossy blacks and the red tails, which is the red tails on the right there. Uh, they're endangered species, but the yellow tail black, black cockatoo has adapted to eating pine cones. So we've got, you know, they're everywhere. Wherever yep. you've got pine plantations, you've got yellow tailed black cockatoos. But we've got a whole bunch of people sort of planting out she oaks, particularly in banksias in some areas, to protect these glossy blacks or the red tailed blacks. But but what I'm saying is that let's let's tell the farmers about the the timber that you can produce from uh, drooping she oak. This is one of the most I've I've milled some up from rem, uh, failed uh, just trees on the ground and sold it for guitar fretboards. It's stunning timber, and wow. it grows it grows in 30 years. You could produce a log like I'm milling up here and the red colour. And if if farmers were encouraged to grow this as a timber. There wouldn't be a shortage of food for the red-tailed black cockatoos. They'd yep. be like the yellow tails. They'd be everywhere, even though the farmers are growing it with the intention of cutting it down. Because lots of farmers are growing it, there'd be plenty of resource, like there is pine cones. So we have to think of ways where being like on your property, being a commercial grower is actually supporting biodiversity, and saying, well, okay, what would government, if you're in a biodiversity research department, what would you do? Well, you'd actually do some wood study and production research on this because you wanted farmers to grow it. It sounds perverse. You want to encourage people to cut this tree down because you want more of them. Yeah. Whereas in urban areas and, uh, and around the country, we've got tree protection rules and saying, oh, you can't cut a tree down. Well, irrational farmers go, well, if, you, if you're not going to let me cut down a native tree in the future, I'm not going to plant a native tree. It's just rational behaviour. Yeah. So we we got to work out. We've got to have our safeguards, of course. But it would be very simple to say to farmers: if you plant and grow she oaks or other native specialty timbers, you retain the right to harvest. In fact, we'll we'll celebrate that. We'll help you do. We'll do some of the research to help you learn how to do it in some way and grow forward. So I'm really excited about that. Not just grow trees, cut them down, but actually creating these perpetual forests in some yeah. way. So, so there's there's so many species. There's, uh, you know, I grow a lot of the rainforest species from from Queensland. There's Andrew growing spotted yeah. gum. Some of these species are indigenous to our area, or none of them are the ones I've just showed you. Uh, but with climate change, where we're on, our native trees are under a lot of stress here, and the manna gums and the messmates and the backwoods are all are all suffering. Um, so, you know, some people say we're playing God, but we're just looking a bit north to New South Wales and drier areas and saying we have to find species that we plant now that are actually going to be able to survive 30 or 50 years. Yep. And uh, some of the heat waves we've had are extraordinary. They're just heat waves that have never been experienced in this area. And the trees, even in a wet year, they suffer that stress that's induced by that temp temperature even just not dropping down enough overnight, a three or four day heat wave, even if it's not a drought, can take out so much vegetation. So yeah. as a group, we're looking at how we can sort of set up our farms to be resilient, 
you know, when you, you either, with climate change, you, you both lock up carbon, but you also adapt your farming systems. And unfortunately, we have a range of different native species, rainforest species and good, uh, you know, the eucalypts and native pines further north that produce really good timber, durable timber, fantastic natural durable timbers, and, uh, and can be grown on these farms and will cope with these high temperatures. We're still trying to protect our native remnants, Yep. But I'm not sure that they're going to be the, the tree component of them is going is not going to survive. You know, there's 600 species of eucalypts around our country, and they've all developed over thousands of years. They've adapted to a particular ecotone, we call it, a certain way up the mountain, or a certain size of aspect, or a certain rainfall. And we know if you drive up a hill, you see different eucalypts at different altitudes. Well. That's, that's the history, but what yep. does that history tell you? If we change the climate, that line between those species is going to move as well, uh, and what's going to come in to replace it? So we're really facing some, some real issues. So Andrew's, uh, Andrew there on the left, he, I got him to bring his lamb up for this photo. And so, so there's the farmer and the forester. And yep. uh, so we each have different motivations for wanting to grow trees. I use sheep on our farm to reduce the fire threat uh, to to actually, I think, make it more attractive, but to also turn over the manures. Uh, Andrew used trees on his place to support his agriculture. Yeah. And so, again, yeah. that example about a combination of agriculture and forestry being done by different people in a similar landscape, he's just over the hill, but in a different combination because we come from different motivations and stuff. And uh, I can benefit from the agriculture and he can benefit from the trees on his place. So it's a really exciting area to be in even if it's uncertain with regard to climate and markets in the future well one thing's for sure this is not uh this is going to help that situation you know uh, planting trees um you know there's so many studies that have been done on how it actually draws in moisture holds on to it um yeah and changes uh <laughs> yeah so you know well, it, yeah. Have you been in a forest when the uh, sun peaks over the hill and the sun hits the canopy and then it starts raining and you look up and there's not a cloud in the sky? So yeah. what happens overnight, you get the dew on all the leaf, all, all the surface area of the leaves. You get condensation on those. And as soon as the temperature just rises a degree, it just rains. And I just it just fascinates me. It actually happened this morning. I looked up and... It's, why am I getting hit by all this drizzle? And it's just blowing in from the trees just near our house, but there wasn't a cloud in the sky. So we get that high humidity at ground level as well as shelter it from the, the sun and the drying winds. But you're right, we'll get more rainfall if yep. we have large areas of trees across the landscape. And we've seen that in Western Australia where the clearing of the wheat belt actually led to the, the stopping of the rain reaching the wheat belt area. Yep. Because once you, you, once you lose the canopy, you stop getting that re-transpiration and evaporation of the, the clouds that move the, the rain further inland. And it's, it's a great case studies in around Lake Victoria in Africa as well, which is the, becoming droughted because it's actually the forest has been lost that connects yeah. Lake Victoria with Congo. So it's, there's, yeah, there's a lot of good science, but there's so much that landholders can learn about their own trees just by understanding a little bit about what's happening. I had the pleasure of, uh, well, it's not a few years ago now, but it's about, well, it must be 10 or 12 years ago of um, having Alan Savory as a guest and we put on a dinner for him. And um, he explained there were quite a few farmers that I invited along as well, who I knew would be really interested in the conversations that we had. And um, yeah, his work is just incredible where they've actually started replanting some of the, well, I mean, he was doing this in the 80s and 90s and he's got some great, images of you know farms where certain trees stopped erosion but then yeah the actual rainfall in the area started to increase again and it's a, it can happen quite fast you know so um it just makes sense to me you know if you've got a if you take vegetation away and it, mm. yeah it's not rocket science yeah. no and that's uh you know it's, it's, we do need more research but we don't need a lot because a lot of it is pretty basic if yeah. we just have that that way of looking at it and appreciating it. And I think uh, people who, who, uh, who live and work on the land, uh, 
if we're able to help them interpret what they know, uh, you know, if they if they understand and can read the landscape better, they they have these observations. They just sometimes need someone to help them interpret them and understand how that's working in terms of the ecology that's operating there. Then they can take it forward and they can share it with other people in their in their community. And uh, that learning from farmers learn from each other is something that I'm. Um, I've been working with Andrew on in peer mentoring in the yeah. community, and that's been fascinating about how how ideas travel. And Andrew, we have people come down to our area and say, "How come you all grow trees?" And I said, "Well, it's it's just because we've been talking about them for so long." And it's and, called uh, culture. Don't your, it's called culture. Don't your community talk about trees? <laughs> yeah, that's that's, that's that, the great uh, word for that is culture. You know, you breed you breed it in an area, and it, becomes it becomes something you know so yeah. i really want to thank you for do you still surf by the way uh yeah i've actually i just turned 60 and i promised myself a, a new surfboard and a wetsuit this year and uh no but I, I i get up every summer i went in after easter and damn it was gee it was cold so uh <laughs> just i i grew up uh, surfing down on the great ocean road which is only 20 minutes away from the farm here but uh, you probably know oh. once you get a farm you, you're too busy so it doesn't work out that way. Well, for so, yeah, it's been that, done. Yeah, I want to really thank you for your passion and all the work that you've done. And uh, I, I personally believe this is uh, a really exciting time. And I think that people are ready. You know, my dad used to say it's all about timing. And I think that although you've yeah. been doing this for a long time, I think this is something that will be embraced globally really quickly now that people understand the multiple benefits, but also that the consumers will start demanding it will, and that will be a great way forward. Um, anybody that's interested, um, I'll tag you on Bambra Agroforestry. You can follow Rowan's work and he's got this great book, Heartwood, which I recommend to anyone that's interested in, in this uh, topic. Thank you so much, Rowan. Really appreciate your time. No, thanks. Thanks, yes. It's been great. Bye.